the most critical element, the single most valuable tool that continues to elude us is the ability to write down principal loan balances on troubled mortgages. It's a tool we must be able to access either through bankruptcy courts or through federal laws that mandate that these uh, loan balances be written down by banks and servicers. Uh, the Durbin bill has been stalled now for I don't know how many years. Uh, there are other bills both in the House and Senate that would address this problem. But we follow this pretty closely and it's safe to say that neither of them are going to go anywhere and that's true because of opposition both on the Republican and the Democratic side of the aisle. Uh, let's look at the facts and see why we need to rewrite these loan balances. Foreclosure crisis has caused a huge reduction in property values all over the country. Right here in Northeast Ohio, in the Elyria Cleveland Mentor SMSA, that statistical planning area, 51% of all mortgages are in a negative equity position. Think about it. More than half of the mortgages in this in this region are, as they use the term, underwater. So uh, if a homeowner, and then you have to consider this fact, if you're in a negative negative position, and if a homeowner is struggling, let's pick an example, a $100,000 mortgage. We see a lot of those in the county. If the homeowner is struggling with a $100,000 mortgage and the property is worth only $60,000 today, does it make sense to refuse to modify that mortgage? Does it make sense to go ahead and foreclose on the property, evict the residents, and watch the home go vacant and dark, often to be vandalized to the point where there's no value at all. There are housing counselors in this room. They have seen this happen over and over again. Wouldn't it be smarter to keep that homeowner in place, modify the mortgage balance to a number that more closely reflects the true value of the property? I think so. I think most people who are battling these foreclosures will think so. But there's the argument, and I hear it a lot, and I hear it especially in some quarters of Congress about the old moral hazard argument, you know, the one that talks about the sanctity of contracts, the old deal is a deal argument. And, you know, by and large, I have to tell you, they are right. A deal is a deal. They did sign a contract. These people, these, people, these homeowners entered into these contracts with open eyes. They took advantage of loose income reporting requirements. Remember the no-document loans, also known as liar's loans? You know, of the $3 trillion in mortgages issued in this country in 2006, three quarters did not document income. And almost a similar number, 70%, provided no down payment. So there's a good chance these homeowners are not entirely truthful about what they were making. They probably didn't put much in the way of a down payment. So, you know, I understand the moral hazard argument. I really do. But the flip side of that coin, and there is the flip side, is the fact that the geniuses on Wall Street who created this mess, Really, they did create it. Haven't felt, have they felt relatively little pain? In fact, bonuses on Wall Street in December of last year were the highest in the history of Wall Street. Less than 14 months under hundreds, after hundreds of millions, hundreds of billions of dollars of U.S. tax dollars were used to bail, out, bail them out. So if you want to talk moral hazards to me, that's fine, but not unless you're willing to talk about taxing Wall Street bonuses at 75 or 80 percent. Let's not play that game though, why don't we just try to find a way to modify these mortgages and save what we can and what's left of some very distressed communities. Congressman Kucinich has been our loudest voice on this, our strongest advocate in this fight to get recognition, the right to get the kind of help from Washington, D.C. That, uh, that we need. He's hosting Secretary of uh, Treasury Herb Allison here next month on March 3rd. In fact, I know this topic of mortgage balance write-downs will be on the table as a topic of discussion. Okay, I have to take a sip of water because I have good news. Um, and that is that um, we're not going to talk about the land bank. I can't think of any finer example of regionalism, regional cooperation of Democrats and Republicans working together than the passage of December of 2008 of Senate Bill 353, the bill that established the Cuyahoga County Land Reutilization Corporation, what we refer to as the county land bank. The land bank legislation came about as a result of efforts initiated by the Vacant Property Coalition, people like Frank Ford, Kermit Lind, and neighborhood people from all over Cleveland as a response to the 35,000 vacant properties we now have in Cuyahoga County and the many, many thousands of vacant properties that are awaiting demolition. We knew that we needed a powerful tool to help restore order to the chaotic situation caused by this real estate crisis. The goal of the county land bank is best summed up by its mission statement. And I kid today at a board meeting, I really get to know this by heart, there aren't that many words, but I will read it. The mission of the CCLRC is to strategically acquire properties, increase property values, 
support community goals, and improve the quality of life for county residents. Pretty simple. For those of you who don't know, the Land Bank is a quasi-public entity governed by a seven-member board, two commissioners, the county treasurer, two suburban mayors, and two representatives of the city of Cleveland. It's funded through a system that allows the Land Bank to pay off unpaid property taxes and to shift the penalties and interest earned to the Land Bank so it give it as to give it a revenue stream. We have, in Senate Bill 353, the Land Bank legislation, partnered with House Bill 294, written largely by Gus Rangos, who is the president of the Land Bank, which is a bill that allows us to accelerate the foreclosure of delinquent, tax delinquent, vacant and abandoned properties, what could be a year and a half. We can now do those in 60 to 90 days. We have in those two bills, we've been given, I think, the most comprehensive program in the country to deal with vacant properties. The accomplishments of the County Land Bank in really just about 10 and a half months are so numerous, I will run through them as thoroughly as I can. But I did want to take a minute, if I can, to introduce uh, the Land Bank staff. If they wouldn't mind standing, President Gus Frangos, Bill Whitney, Cheryl Stevens, Bill, Bob Rink, Dennis, everybody please stand, Jim, Jackie. You might want to applaud them again after you hear what they've done in just a short order, but um, the Land Bank has created an infrastructure that will enable it to accomplish its mission, including bidding out and awarding contracts to responsible preservation companies that will be responsible for maintaining the almost 200 properties in its possession. Now, I'll tell you, that number is growing rapidly. We had a Land Bank board meeting this morning, and we suspect that another 600 properties will have about a total of 650 properties in the Land Bank's portfolio by the end of the year. Uh, the strategy has always been as these bring these properties in that we would triage. Some of these properties need to be demolished, which is why we've had to move on demolition contracts. Some will be preserved, uh, and the cost of preservation is something we have to take into effect as we budget. We're very fortunate. We have a company in town. We have a lot of companies that do this, but the largest property preservation firm in the country, privately held, is right here in Cleveland, owned by a man named Robert Klein. The company is called Safeguard. They employ hundreds of people out in Valley View. We're fortunate to have them here in town. So some will be preserved. And then in the third category of properties, we'll have those that we need to sell quickly because they have value. Another one of the critical elements of the bill, and I'm diverting from my speech again, is that under the new tax lien law, uh, Senate Bill 353, tax uh, land bank law, when a property is foreclosed for non-payment of property taxes, under the old system, that property would be adjudicated, foreclosed. It would go to the judge. The judge would send it to the sheriff, and there would be an auction. If the property had value, somebody was there with a check to take that property off of our hands. If the property had no value, and that was very often the case, that property would go to a second sale, then to an auditor's sale where it went at a reduced price. Eventually, that property would ask cheat to the state and became the responsibility of all of us in this room. Under the new system, all properties that are now tax delinquent will be adjudicated foreclosed. They will be sent to the, uh, they will be sent to the, uh, to the land bank in 45 days on a direct transfer if folks don't come in and make good on those property taxes. So that's a huge difference, and that means the properties, some properties of value will go to the land bank where I believe eventually they'll be held, eventually sold. It also means we'll be taking a lot of the properties that were going to be our responsibility anyway. So we expect that number of properties to grow rapidly. Um, We've also established a streamlined demolition bidding process and have entered into multiple contracts with demolition companies. There's some really exciting things going on. I'm not liberty to talk about yet about how we're going to do that, how we can cut costs. Maybe that'll be a speech that somebody else gives next year. Though in its early operational phase, the Land Bank uh, has uh, about 60 properties right now slated for demolition with 80 properties we're preparing bids on. The Land Bank has entered into memorandums of understanding with cities like Cleveland, Garfield Heights, Berea, South Euclid, Shaker Heights Euclid, and other communities that will govern how property acquired by the land bank is disposed of in these communities. We've already transferred properties to or established working protocols with Bedford, Bedford Heights, Cleveland Heights, Brooklyn, North Royalton, University Heights, and South Euclid. I know that Gus Frangos was in, Ro in the Bay Village yesterday meeting with Debbie Sutherland to work out a protocol there. By the way, folks, every community in this county, I venture to say even Honey Valley, will eventually have properties that come into the land bank's possession. So it's important we establish protocols with all these communities. 